We are so glad you've joined us from Douglas County or wherever you're watching around the world. And we're in a series called Unity, Even When We Don't Agree. And the, the part that I want you to hear, and I'm going to repeat it a number of times today, is that unity has to start in our heads with what we really know of the truth. And then it has to be in our hearts with what we trust in what we say we believe and how it, it becomes more a part of our life. And then it comes out our mouths, that our words are so vital to either building unity or destroying it. And let me tell you, it's much easier to destroy than it is to build. So the message this weekend is called the language of the kingdom. And it's a very simple idea that we have become a part of the kingdom of God and Jesus has invited us into his family and that we need to learn how to speak the king's language which we will do in a, a broken fashion. When you're first trying to learn a foreign language, you know, you, you say the El Baño, and you, you make all kinds of sort of, I know this word, and I know what that means. I just don't know how to string them together. And if you're going to learn a foreign language, I'll tell you one thing you've got to be willing to do. You've got to be willing to jump in and try and kind of make a fool of yourself occasionally. Now, I've done it several times, but I heard a funnier story that's funnier than mine. There was a, uh, a couple that was over visiting in Spain, and the wife spoke fluent Spanish, and so she had done most of the discussing. And the, the husband had talked a little bit because he, you know, he'd studied Spanish in high school, and that was about it. And he, he had very limited language skills. So he decided he was going to surprise his wife. They were staying in a motel there in Spain. And, and he got up one, early one morning, and he was going to go down and try to get a couple of pastries and bring them back to the room and just, just be sweet. And so he found a corner coffee shop, and he he went inside, and everybody's, you know, of course, speaking in Spanish, and he can't understand any of it. And, and, and behind the counter, he sees on the shelf, he sees two nice pastries, well, a bunch of nice pastries, and he thinks, oh, I want those. And beneath them, there was a sign, and it said something about borrachos. And he said, oh, that must be what they're called, you know. Quick, quick idea here. So he practices and thinks how to say it and try to think about his pronunciation, and so he quietly says to, to the guy behind the counter, yo quiero dos borrachos. And the guy said, okay, mande? And, and so he says, well, maybe I didn't quite pronounce it right. And he's thinking, two R's, that's, that's R. Okay, I'll, I'll try again. So a little louder, he says, yo quiero dos barrachos. And by that time, everybody on the counter is kind of stopped. And, and they're all giving this knowing smile, like, yeah, here's a gringo. And, and so the guy behind the counter baits him and sets him up once more. He says, okay, puedo? And, and, and he says, Yo quiero dos borrachos. And of course, then they all erupted in laughter, and he couldn't figure out why he was being made fun of, and he just quickly retreated out and went back to his room. And, and he said, told his wife what happened. He said, I, I tried to bring you some, some pastries. And she said, what did you actually say? And he said, yo quiero dos borrachos. And she laughed, and she said, I'm not sure why that sign was back there, but what you said is I'd like two drunks to go. Um, maybe the sign meant drunks are not welcome here or you can't drink here, eat here when you're inebriated. But he, he was trying to speak a language that was not he was not comfortable with, that was foreign to him. And I'm telling you that when we learn to speak the language of truth in love, when we learn to respond in a way that builds unity and connection and depth and purpose, you will do it poorly at the beginning but it's worth doing poorly until you can do it better. And so I want us to walk through Ephesians chapter 4, if you would turn your Bibles to that, that passage. And we visited that not too long ago, but I want to particularly look at how unity comes from the words that we speak and how that happens in our daily life. And so the, the unity uh, that we are discussing, the definition we talked about last week is cooperating with other believers because of the importance of the gospel that I am getting along with people who are different from me because, and we ended last week with saying, so the world may know, because we are to be the, the examples, the ambassadors of what it means to be followers of Jesus and how we are loving and connected to each other is supposed to be a demonstration of the love and the connectedness that God has within the Trinity and for us. And so we're going to start with Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. If you don't have your Bible, you can open your YouVersion app, or if you have the Family Church app, you can just punch that little uh, Ephesians 4, and it'll take you right there. Ephesians 4 says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, 
I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So first of all, he says, you need to, to be making your calling, to live according to your calling, that, that you understand who God is and what he's done in sending Jesus and that you've been adopted into his family. And, and we're supposed to live a life that's equivalent, that's connected to that calling. So that's, that's what we learn and what we know. And then he talks about these, these pesky attitudes that keep coming up all the way through the New Testament. Be completely humble and gentle and patient and bearing with one another in love. And then he says, and notice this, this phrase here, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So unity has to be hard fought for and it has to be worked at to continue because, listen, unity is difficult to build and it is easily destroyed. Just a couple of words can make a difference. And we laughed together last week as we talked about conflicts over silly things like which way the, the toilet paper roll should go on the holder. And yet our, our unity can be destroyed so quickly about things that are not even that silly, but they're, they're not central to what we believe. So let's walk through the two simple parts of what it means to build unity with my tongue, with my mouth. And one is to believe the truth, and the other is to speak the truth. And I want to explain those in ways that maybe will make it a little bit more clear and maybe a little more practical for you in your life. He says, if we are to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit, he goes on with this idea that if we believe the truth, if we not only understand and know it and get information about it so that we know the truth, but if we come more and more and more to put our trust in and to live out of that, he goes on and he says, here's what will happen. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. He's saying that our unity is going to be attacked. That if we do not carefully protect it as if we don't grow up in our spirituality and learn how to protect the unity, then we're going to get blown around by all the forces of our culture. And in fact, it's not even just unintentional. He said there's some people that are deceitful and scheming. So let me give you an illustration of this. When you build a house, when you build a shed, when you do anything that's going to be permanent, it's really, really important that you get a very, very solid foundation. And I liken that to, to the idea that we have to know the truth of who God is and who Jesus is and what the gospel is, and we're going to walk through that in just a moment. But it's not enough to just have your building sitting on the foundation. It can't just be resting there and held by gravity. In fact, they make very poor judgments when you hit a wave or when a huge wind comes up. Your wonderful home, your wonderful shed can be moved off of the foundation unless it is securely bolted in. And so, when they're giving you the specs, they do all kinds of things about how to put a lag bolt down and anchor it in the concrete or put epoxy in it and so that your building is connected to your foundation. And then when you, when you do the rafters up top, it's not enough just to throw a nail or a screw in it. They're, they put on what they call hurricane clips, which are to hold it together, not in the normal times, but when the wind is blowing, when the, the waves are coming up, when there is pressure. And of course, this year we have seen so much pressure on our lives. And unfortunately, it has shown that not everybody has really got their life bolted to the foundation. So let me give you an example of what believing the truth is and then how some practical ways we can apply that to how our life is bolted into it. So way back in the beginning of this last series, we talked about what are four words that describe the gospel and We've chosen four words to talk about the big pieces of the gospel that we need to understand that God created us, that these are the essentials. We were created by a wonderful creator with a divine plan, and, and he chose us to make it in his image. And, and then the story of the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve and the fall, and that we chose not to follow God. And because of that, we are under a curse and we have inherited the tendency to ignore God and to do what we want and to go our own way. And then the, the rescue of Jesus, how he came to earth to live 
and to give his life so that we could be, first of all, forgiven for our sin, but then given Oh, the goodness of Jesus and to have the resurrection power of Jesus, not just when we accept Christ for the first time, but every single day. And then the the fact that God is working to the restoration of all things, that ultimately God is going to draw all of the universe into harmony, into oneness, and it's going to be focused on worshiping Jesus and living together in eternal life. And those are the simple pieces of the gospel. And as we've been reading through a book um, called Gospel Fluency by Jeff Vanderstelt. It's been really convicting for me because as I'm somebody who's grown up knowing the Bible, knowing these simple truths for, for years and years, and I've preached them and taught them. And yet as we've really walked through and asked the question, is your life really bolted to those things? Does that really influence your daily thinking and your ways of relating? And you know, I look back and in creation it says, My worth and my value and my identity comes because I'm an image bearer of God. But you know, as I look in my own heart, I think, you know, what really makes me feel good is is if I feel like I'm wearing appropriate clothes that people like or that I've lost weight or or that I'm I'm able to accomplish something. And specifically, when, when I do something and people say, oh, that's nice or that was a good job or way to go, that my identity and my my feeling of worth often doesn't come from the fact that God created me. It comes from how people are treating me in the moment. And I don't have to tell you that that's a pretty temporary situation and a, an unstable one. And then I look at the idea of the fall, and, you know, I, I feel like it's easy for us to say, well, I didn't do any big sins this week, or I didn't get caught at any big sins. But when God's at work to reveal sin and how it, we're, we're shot through with all of it, I realize that even in my best moments, trying to do something for the Lord, even trying to extend myself to help someone, man, if somebody criticizes me, I am so quick to feel slighted and like it's not fair and maybe even angry. And when I look at my heart, I realize, man, I have all kinds of sinful and lustful thoughts and actions all week, all week long that scrolling through the internet and I'm attracted to a lustful picture or or to wanting to have a new car or a new something and greed comes right up and then somebody hurts me and bitterness and resentment and boy, all those things are, are bubbling up in me all the time. And, and I think I often just try to hide them and just try to think I'm going to get by on my own. But the reality is unless I acknowledge them, I can't be rescued from them. If I believe the gospel, then those are not things to be hidden. Those are things to be expressed so that I can be rescued. And the third part is that there's really only one Savior. I need Jesus to forgive and to heal and empower my life so that I can live in freedom. And you know what? There are so many other ways that I have of escaping and coping. And when things are rough and I don't feel good about myself or or sin comes up in my life, it's easy for me just to want to escape and go shopping or go eat something or, or do something that just keeps me busy. And I wouldn't really think of it at the time, but I'm looking at other things to save me, to make me feel worthy and valuable and to give my life meaning, and not Jesus. And, and I don't have a bolt that is sunk into that part of the, the foundation. And then when I think of what real hope is, is the restoration that God is going to bring everything together at the end, and it's the eternal things, the invisible things, are what matter and what last. But I so get caught up in what the next fun thing is. And I, and I think about my life and it's worth it because I have a fun thing coming up this weekend or I have a trip that I've planned to Ohio or, or I've got some things that I'm living for that have nothing to do with eternity. And again, those are, <laughs> as, as you know, everything has been put on the hold because of the, the COVID. And so as we've gone through this, it's been revealing to me that there's a way in which I can, I can be built on the foundation but not anchored in it, not really secure and focused on it so that the wind and the waves don't throw me off the foundation. Let's let's walk through that a little more deeply because if we're going to have this kind of unity, if we're going to be tied together deeply, it has to be because each of us are maturing and growing in our ability to connect our lives to the truths of Jesus 
And then we need to do that and help each other do that as a group, as a church family. And so we have to know the truth. We have to become convinced of it. And then we have to learn to speak the truth. It has to come to our head and then in our heart as we trust it and believe it. And then it has to come out of our mouths. And even in those verses we read in Ephesians 4, if I understand the calling that God's given me and I want to live, then the attitudes of my heart about humility and about being able to bear with each other, those those come out of my heart and then out of my mouth comes the right kinds of language. And I'm going to jump down just a little bit further in this chapter and show you what he says exactly this. He says, not only do we need to know the truth, but we need to speak the truth. And in verse 15 it says, Instead, instead of being blown around by the winds and waves, instead of arguing and disputing, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. Instead of being blown around, we are going to be firmly anchored in Jesus. And because of that, we're going to grow up by speaking the language of the kingdom, which is truth in love dialect. And because of that, we're going to become more like Jesus. That's how you know that you are believing it. That's beginning to come out your mouth. In fact, Jesus himself said, out of the overflow of the heart comes the mouth. You can fake being humble. You can fake getting along with people. You can fake civility. But when it comes to really being humble and really loving and really caring for others and, and believing that the gospel can rescue them as well, you can't fake that. And it will come out your mouth somewhere. And so, he says, in every respect, we need to speak the truth in love, and then we will all grow up in every respect to be the mature body. We are to grow individually, and we are to grow as a church family. And then we're going to go back to verse 4. And he again lays this kind of foundation for it. Why should we be unified? He says, there's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. When we're doing Bible study methods, we try to encourage you to look for repeated words. It's not too hard to see what it is in this passage, is it? He says there's one, one, one. There's one God. And ironically, it mentions all three persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But there's one God. And there's only one church. There's one body. And he says we are called to one hope. There's one baptism. There's one foundation. And then he talks about this comes from God the Father who is over all, through all, and in all. This unity is to extend. He, it comes from God the Father, so it's a powerful unity that's built on him. But it's to be present in every church family, in everywhere believers are. And so he says that is the unity part of it. And then the diversity part of it is he says, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service. So he starts talking about spiritual gifts and how we, in, in specifically the church leadership, are, are different in our gifting and that a, a prophet and a teacher may see things differently and, and that those differences are not problems. Those are vital to the health of the body. Just like you have a finger and a nose and a kneecap and an ear, and they're to do different things. And if they are each doing their part, then the body is healthy and whole and mobile. And so there is all the way through the scriptures. That's, I want you to see that this idea of unity doesn't just come because <laughs> we're being stressed in unity right now, but to see that it is a heartbeat of the New Testament all the way through. And so he said, you're going to be different in the way that you see things. You're going to be different in your spiritual gifts. You're going to be different in the way that you were called to work together. But remember, underneath all that is this foundation. One Lord, one faith. And because of that, we have one hope. So we need to speak the truth. And in, on down the chapter, he gives us some very, very specific and practical instructions. He says, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith. So unity is, comes from God. It's something that we have to work at in our relationship with each other. And then someday we will all be fully unified as we are restored in the final state. And it says, and becoming mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So he talks about that we are going to someday be fully unified. But until then, we have to work consistently at it. And specifically, he talks about 
that the language of our lips, the unity language, truth in love, needs to be about building people up. And I don't know why when we say speak truth in love, our first tendency is to think, well, I need to correct people, but I need to do it nicely. I need to tell them something, a compliment, you know, kiss, slap, kiss kind of thing where, where, I, where I, I bracket it with ways in which I can preserve the relationship. And I think that that's maybe a part of speaking truth in love, but that is not the primary piece. Speaking truth in love starts with speaking the truth of the gospel, that we tell people about who God is and what he's done, and we, we exhibit the attitudes of Christ, and then we're focused on building people up, that our words should be primarily encouraging and secondarily admonishing or correcting. And I, This is a challenge for you as parents to ask yourself, do I often tell my kids, you're doing a great job, way to go, or do I just pick at what they don't do right? If they get all state, do I say, well, you should have got a, got a national? Do, do I say, you got a B, but you should have had an A? Do I, do I keep the correction without the encouragement? It's a great way to destroy unity. And he gets very, very specific down later in the chapter. He says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. That's a strong verse. That bothers me, I tell you. From one who, who has a mouth that operates faster than my brain too often, uh, he says, don't let any unwholesome talk. And I think we sometimes pull that down and say, try not to swear, <laughs> especially when another Christian is around. No, he says, I don't want you to let any words out of your mouth that will destroy the unity of the body, that will discourage somebody. He says, I want you to make the focus of your mouth be what's helpful for building them up according to their needs that it may benefit them. As Americans, I think we are so backwards. Our idea is that I speak because I'm expressing myself and I need to give my opinion. And in fact, I have a tendency to see how things should be. So correcting people is really loving. And I don't think we realize how arrogant that is. And we usually start with our mouth first. And actually... What the scripture teaches us about how to speak in love comes out in James chapter 1. We need to first of all learn to listen. You see, the, the idea that we have is that I'm going to make unity even by what I say. And I want to encourage you to go one step back. Building unity starts with listening well. In fact, James says it like this. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Man, we are never more self-righteous when we're on our moral high horse, and we think we're right, and you're wrong, and we're going to straighten somebody out for the good of the kingdom. And let me tell you, the people that do that rarely want it done to them. It's not really what builds unity. It's not what builds trust. It's, he says, I want you to be listening very, very carefully. Be quick to hear. In fact, uh, we're going through marriage team again with somebody, and I, I was convicted by this statement in marriage team. It said, most people listen with an intent to reply rather than to understand. Oh, is that not true? That when I'm listening to somebody, I'm thinking of something I can say. And sometimes it's something to top them, and sometimes it's something to rebut what they just said, or sometimes it's just a rabbit trail but really listening. In fact, the discipline of marriage team is to repeat back and say, what I hear you saying is, and even doing that just stops you from listening with your answer running. So if we're going to speak the truth in love, if we're going to build unity, if it's going to be in our heads and in our hearts and out of our mouths, first of all, it starts with silence. Then he says, how do we then make that, those words really powerful and, and connective? Well, the next advice, piece of advice that you will get from the scriptures is to stop arguing. I think this is extremely relevant to our time frame. You ever ask yourself the question, what am I like to live with? What is it like to be around me? You see, the tendency we have is to focus on my feelings and your actions and how you're making me feel. And love means turning that around and focusing on my actions and how it makes you feel. You ever think of what you're like to work with? You ever think what it's like to be a neighbor to you? And we often are so 
blind to our own needs. And so in 2 Timothy, when Paul is advising Timothy as a, as a young pastor, he gives him this advice. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments. <laughs> is that clear enough? And you know what? There's a lot of arguments that are in that category, foolish and stupid, because they, you know they produce quarrels. They bring divisions and, and break the unity of the Spirit. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to who? Everyone. Able to teach, not resentful. You see, I, I want you to see that this idea of the way that our mouth affects unity is all the way through the New Testament. And Paul says to Timothy, don't have anything to do with those arguments. If you are a servant of the Lord, if you believe the gospel, then quarrelsomeness is not, is not part of that. It's, it's not mature. And so we need to learn to speak the truth in love. And then, of course, the, the, the kicker there is it always has to be in love. That there's a tendency that we have to judge people so easily. I, I saw funny t-shirt the other day. It says, I'm silently correcting your grammar as I listen. <laughs> oh, uh, that is so true. We, we're listening. We're looking at you. I'm still not saying anything, but that doesn't mean I'm loving you. It doesn't mean I'm thinking about how I can build you up. And so we not only need to build up people and make an effort to just practical ways to build at unity. I'm going to challenge you to something even more deep, which is we need to speak the gospel. We need to tie the things that we're saying to build the unity of the church family. We need to tie them to those four pieces of what I said were the gospel early on. And I want to give you an illustration that also comes from Jeff Vanderstelt as he's dealing with his own kids. So he's hearing from downstairs a loud debate because his kids are playing the game Shoots and Ladders. And if you've ever played that game, you may have had some loud debates as well. But he, he comes downstairs and he goes, what's going on? What's going on? And and his two kids' names are Caleb and Haley. And Caleb says, she cheated, and he is so upset. And then Haley says to him, well, he ripped the head off of that, about that character that's in the game. And, and he was, and she started accusing him, and he started accusing her. And dad says, wait, 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 here. Caleb, did you rip the head off of that figure? And Caleb did what he called the turtle. And he, he pulls his big t-shirt up and he pulls his head down inside of it and he pulls it down over his knees and he makes himself as small and as hidden as he can. You think, what, what a picture of how we respond to our sin quite often. And you know, the bad dad, Jeff could have said, well, shame on you. Can't you see that you destroyed that game and what were you thinking? And we act off and out of our own irritation and just we want the behavior to change, but we don't think of what we're doing to the heart. And he could have barked at Haley and said something about cheating and he could have stormed off. And he said, but that wouldn't have been speaking the truth in love. That would not have been speaking the gospel. And so he said to his son, he said, Caleb, you, you don't have to hide, you know. We all sin. We all have these places where we struggle. And what I've told you before is that Jesus is the only one that can save us. And you didn't feel good about yourself because you were losing the game. And so you tried to, to make yourself feel better by, by taking a figure and ripping the head off. And now you feel embarrassed and ashamed and, and like you want to run away and hide. And I understand that. In fact, that's what all of us tend to do. And, and I would say to you, I think we hide a lot in activity sometimes in religion, sometimes in good works, sometimes in a lot of just busyness and activities. And we want to hide instead of deal with the fact that we have a sinful heart, that we forget the goodness of God and the truth of the gospel and we pull away into to those activities. And he began to talk to him instead of in a harsh and shame on you kind of way. He talked to him about the fact that you need Jesus and Jesus can rescue you. And he's the only one that can help. And as he did that slowly, his head came up out of the t-shirt and he began to look around and he sobbed and he said, Dad, I tore that part. I tore that figure. And his dad opened his arms and he ran over and he, and he hugged him and there was some resolution. But Haley said, see, I told you he did it. 
So he looked at Haley and he said, Haley, I know that that you weren't feeling very good about yourself because you were losing the game. And did you cheat so that you could get ahead? And she kind of got really quiet. And he said, what I, what I feel like is that because you were upset and because you did what was wrong, instead of dealing with the fact that you were sinning, you decided to blame your brother and make it about him and what he had done. And you're accusing him to make yourself feel better. She gets really quiet and he said, do you understand that that doesn't work? That daddy tries that sometimes too? I I like to look down on other people, especially where I'm strong and they're weak, but it doesn't take care of the sin inside of me. And it's only Jesus that can rescue us and only he that can forgive us. And it's he is the only place where we we feel good about ourselves, whether we we feel like we're losing or winning the game. We, We can have peace inside. She said, Daddy, I I don't know why I always do that. I I do that. And at the end of that, he was able to take both kids in his arms and and to pray with them and for them to ask God for forgiveness and for them to ask each other for forgiveness. And instead of an interruption to his schedule where he lined them out and got them to behave, there was this beautiful gospel moment where he was able to get underneath the actions and the bad behaviors to see what, the, what they weren't believing, what they didn't understand, and to speak the truth in love. Not to just line them out, but to get them to understand that those anchor bolts have to go down into the foundation. And I thought, man, that's an awesome moment of parenting. And that, that he got ultimately what they all really needed and wanted instead of just getting the behavior settled and back to what he wanted to do. So I want you to think about this as we speak the truth of the gospel, that whether you're talking to yourself or when you're talking to somebody else, that when you say you don't feel good about yourself and your self-image is struggling and maybe you feel shame and struggling, then go back to who am I? I I am created by a loving God for a deep purpose and, and I have a sin nature. And boy, there's always more sin underneath that sin. And even in my best moments, I have mixed motives. And to acknowledge that sin and to have the freedom of confessing and admitting that. And then to coming for Jesus for rescue instead of escaping or drinking or trying to eat or trying to to escape and get away or hide in your t-shirt or blame somebody else. To come to Jesus and say, "Ah, here I am, I need rescuing again. And then instead of building our hopes on the things that are temporary and instable and and things that will never fully satisfy. We build our things on on the things that are unseen. We build our life because what is unseen is so much more valuable and more important than what is seen. And that ultimately, the things we do for Christ are gonna last forever and the things we do for ourselves are gonna burn up. And I wanna challenge you to think this through that how much of what you say you believe about Jesus and about the gospel, how much of your life is really anchored to that? How does it tie into your parenting and to your driving and to your eating and to to all the parts of your life? And I know this is a new concept for a lot of us, but I hope that God by his spirit draws you as you walk through that this week and start saying, how do I live out what I really say I believe? How do I speak the truth in love? How do I speak the gospel? And I'm going to, Hand off to the online campus pastor and to the other campuses and just take a moment to tamp down some next steps of what we can do to make this real in our lives. Thanks for joining us.